Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Vantage Seminar. So this week, we're continuing with our series on perspectives on Gawa groups. And we're very happy to have Daniel Litt talking to us about Gawa theory of local systems. So um, Daniel, is it all right if we record this talk? It, it is all right. Great. And uh, feel free to ask questions during the talk. Uh, so Daniel, please go ahead. All right, thank you so much. It's nice to be here. Yeah, let me just reiterate, uh, if you have any questions for me, please just interrupt me. Um, it's it, it's nice to have a little bit of a back and forth with these online talks. Uh, so, so everything I'm gonna talk about uh, today is joint work. So some of it is joint with uh, Aaron Landsman and some other parts of it are joint with uh, Josh Lamb. And I'll uh, explain which parts are joint with whom. Um, so, so let me just say, like, the goal of the talk is to introduce and give a survey of some pretty concrete questions in algebra, uh, which come up when one's studying various questions in arithmetic and, and, and number theory. Um, so some of them are quite closely related to things that, that Professor Harbrader talked about on the first uh, talk in this series. Um, and so without further ado, let me let me introduce some of those questions. Okay, so um, the setup is as follows. So uh, this is sort of a very general question you can ask. You start with a group, uh, G. Uh, it can be a finite group or maybe an algebraic group like GLN or SLN. Uh, and you have a bunch of conjugacy classes, C1 through CN uh, in G. So, so if you'd like, if G is GLN, just think a bunch of matrices in Jordan normal form. Uh, and in this setting, there's a, a problem which goes, I think, by two names in the literature. So the Hurwitz problem if G is a, a finite group and the Deline Simpson problem if G is an algebraic group which is uh, it's sort of a Diophantine equation in the group G. So uh, you have these conjugacy classes, C1 through Cn, and you want to know, does there exist G1 and C1, G2 and C2, Gn and Cn, so that some equation is satisfied, and namely the equation is that the product of the GI is the identity. Okay, so, so let me say that again. You're given a bunch of conjugacy classes in a group, and you want to know, can you solve the equation, product of GI is the identity, subject to the constraint that each the ith, ith element of your group GI is in the conjugacy class CI. Um, so let me let me make this question a bit more geometric. Uh, so and I, I think in this language it, it appeared in in, in Harbader's talk in the first talk in the session. So I'm going to call sigma zero n the two sphere minus n points. And if you uh, probably most of you are more algebra geometrically inclined, you can think of that as p one minus n points. Uh, well, what's the fundamental group of that space? Well, you can take a, a loop around each point, which I'm drawing now. So maybe this is the loop around the first point, let's call it gamma one. The loop around the second point would be gamma two, all the way up to gamma n, which would be the loop around the nth point. And the fundamental group of, of, of the space, uh, p1 minus n points, is generated by the gamma i. And there's one relation, which is that if you go around all the gamma i in sequence, then you can kind of contract that composite loop around the back of S2. I don't know if you can see the gesture I'm making in, in, in the little screen in the top right, but that's supposed to be contracting it along the back of the sphere. Uh, and so that gives you the relation that the product of the gamma i is the identity. And it will be useful to think of this Boolean simpson problem or Hurwitz problem in the following way. Uh, namely, is there a homomorphism from this group, pi one of the, the two sphere minus n points, or p one minus n points, into G with the, the following property, namely that it sends uh, gamma i into the conjugacy class. CI for all i. Okay, so th this is a rephrasing of this Boolean Simpson or Hurwitz problem. Okay, so why would you be interested in this problem? Well, it has a, a geometric interpretation in the case where, where G is finite, uh, namely, well, maybe uh, if you ask for a surjective map like this, it asks, is there a G cover of P1 with specified branching? So what you're supposed to think is that, well, a uh, a surjection from the fundamental group onto a finite group is the same as a connected G cover. And, and the, the loops around these punctures control how that G cover branches at each point. OK, and, and this was sort of a precursor to a question that, that David Harbert better discussed in the first talk, which was you know relative, relevant to constructing these covers in order to try to solve the inverse Galois problem over uh, certain fields. OK, what if G is an algebraic group? Well, maybe, maybe this is a little bit more arcane, but I'll try to convince you that it's, it's something you should be interested in. Well, what does this question become? Maybe if G is SLN or, GL, or G, SLR or GLR, uh, it's the question of, does there exist a local system? 
with specified on p1 minus some points with some specified local behavior the punctures um so uh okay so first of all why would you be interested in the second question if you're say interested in the first well i, I claim the second question is, is actually really related to the first one why because if you have a representation is gln let's say over over z or you know any any ring you can reduce it mod p and get a representation into gln fp or fq so so in other words uh the second question is a way of addressing the first question in families where you, you kind of fix your group and vary the prime uh, so you can think for example if you want to construct covers of p1 with covering group a simple group of lee type well those come in families uh indexed by prime powers and, and this is one way of doing it okay uh so i don't know that there's any kind of general solution to this for for finite groups but in the algebraic case this is kind of a, a pretty well understood question so there's work by simpson and kostov and crawley bubby and other people which doesn't quite completely answer this question like i don't think there's a uh, a really simple answer given a bunch of conjugacy classes in GLN. Is there a, 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 are there matrices in those conjugacy classes which multiply to the identity? But at least for generic con conjugacy classes, this is totally understood. Okay, so so let me come to the the next question along these lines. Um, so that's the question of constructing rigid tuples, and and this should be familiar again from from the first talk in the series. Well, what we discussed before is an existence question. So you have some equation, the product of GI is the identity, and you want to solve it subject to some constraint, namely that the GI uh, are in some conjugacy classes CI. So if you have an existence question, you should also ask a uniqueness question. Um, and, and so that's the following question. So I've written it out here. So which conjugacy classes C1 through CN in G, uh, are there uh, you know, elements G1 through GN uh, in those conjugacy classes whose product is the identity. And well, when will this be unique? It'll basically never be literally unique, right? Because if you have one solution, you can just conjugate by an element of G and get another solution. But but you can ask, when is it unique up to simultaneous conjugation? Okay. Uh, so so um, we saw uh, in the first talk in the series, that if G is finite, well, uh, a solution is the same as a cover of P1 with some specified branching data. And, and if the corresponding tuple of elements of G is rigid, that cover has some good arithmetic behavior. So uh, for example, it, it descends to a, a cyclotomic field. Um, and this is useful for solving the inverse Galo problem, the, the point being that if you now take the pre-image under this cover of some rational points of P1, the Hilbert irreducibility tells you that most of the time those will give you uh, extension, G extensions of this field. Um, okay, and there's some, some mild extra conditions you can place on the conjugacy classes to get, get the cover to actually descend to Q. I'm not gonna discuss those. Okay, what about the case where G is an algebraic group? Well, you can just ask the same question and then it becomes the, the question of setting rigid local systems. So, so let me just say in words what this uniqueness means. It means those are local systems, representations of pi one, which are determined up to conjugacy by their local behavior of the punctures. Um, okay, again, why would you do that? Well, first of all, such local systems also have good arithmetic behavior. They're, they're again going to descend to, to P1 over a cyclotomic field. And again, the algebraic group case and finite group case are related. So if you're trying to solve like the inverse Galois problem for families of groups, like families of groups of Lie types, so think like SLNFP, what you would do is construct one of these local systems and then look at the corresponding covers you get by reducing mod p. And so this gives you way of, ways of producing lots and lots of extensions for different groups. Can I ask you a question? Yeah, please. Are all these ends the, the same? You have GLN and you have Q. Oh, uh, oh those N are supposed to be R. These SLN, every time I say a group, I want to use R for the rank of the group. Sorry, thank you for catching that. So the number of points is, is not the same. And how about the Q of mu n? Is that is that so that R? suppose that should have been a capital N, I believe. Oh, so they're all all the ends are different. All the ends are different too. Yeah, oh, any any okay. two letters that appear in this talk are probably different. So, yeah, thank you for asking. Mm. Okay, uh, okay. So so what's known about this question? Um, so again, I I think the finite group case for kind of arbitrary groups is kind of compl complicated. Although a lot is known for specific groups, uh, in the algebraic case. Uh, 
so, so, so the case of representations into the general linear group, these were classified by Katz in, in his book, Rigid Local Systems in, in 1996. Um, and the key property they have is that they're all of geometric origin. So meaning they, they show up in, in the cohomology of, of families of algebraic varieties. Um, I'm going to try to bring that down to earth by the end of the talk. So I want to, uh, I'm going to give you some idea of what Katz's classification looks like. Um, maybe let me just remark that that if you replace GLR with a, another another algebraic group, this is actually more or less open. I think that that is not, except for a few groups. Like I think maybe GSP four or something is understood. For general group, I don't think we really understand rigid G-local systems. Okay, so so let me tell you the nature of Katz's classification because it, it it's really kind of beautiful and miraculous, and it'll show up a little bit later in the talk. Um, so, so before I do that, are there, are there any questions? Okay, so so uh, let me kind of tell you what the shape of Katz's classification is. Um, so, so what are we trying to classify? We're trying to classify tuples of conjugacy classes in the general linear group. I think this time I wrote correctly GLR, and here the ends are the same. Uh, so we're trying to classify tuples of conjugacy classes so that there's a unique uh, set of matrices, GI and CI, whose product is the identity up to simultaneous conjugation. Okay, so what does Katz do? He finds this kind of complicated operation called middle convolution, which I'll, I'll discuss at the end of the talk. Uh, and what it does is it takes a rigid tuple of conjugacy classes, and it produces a new rigid tuple of conjugacy classes, the same number, but in a different group. So, so it produce, you start with, with uh, n r by r matrices, and you get at the end n r prime by r prime matrices. And the, the interesting property is, OK, first of all, this new tuple is rigid. And second of all, r prime is smaller than r. So you've decreased the size of the matrices. OK, so, so what's, what's the idea? Well, then maybe it's clear what to do. You start iterating this procedure. You eventually get down to r is 1. And what is, uh, well, uh, a bunch of one by one matrices which multiply to the identity is just the same thing as a bunch of numbers which multiply to the identity. And those are very easy to classify. Um, OK, so so in what sense is this a classification? Well, the, the, a miracle happens. Uh, I mean, a miracle with a proof. It's not a not an inexplicable miracle. But the miracle is that whatever this middle convolution operation is, it's invertible. So what that means is the, the, the output of Katz's classification is that, well, you classify all uh, rigid tuples in, of one by one matrices, that is just n tuples of numbers multiplying to the identity, and then all rigid tuples are generated by those by iterating this middle convolution operation. Okay, this doesn't mean that like uh, any question you have about rigid local systems is easy to answer. Like there's lots of actually open questions about rigid local systems, despite the fact that there's a classification, but uh, at least it gives you a place to start looking. But just to give you an example, like it was open for quite a while after cats, like, could you classify all rigid local systems where the corresponding representation of like the fundamental group of S2 minus some points that you get has finite image. So that, that was like a open for a while until it was solved by, by Belkali. And there's lots of other interesting open questions about rigid local systems. Okay. Uh, so, so that was all background. I, I want to now start talking about like the actual subject of this talk, which is uh, a strict generalization of the study of rigid local systems. And in some sense, it goes goes back a, a little bit further. So I, I want to kind of introduce this question and then talk a bit about the history. Um, and the question is a dynamical one. Okay, so so let me, uh, well, maybe before I move on to the next question, are there are there any questions about rigid local systems? Uh, yes, uh, Daniel. Mm -hmm. are, so when R is one, there's really no constraint. Any tuple of N numbers that multiply to one is rigid. There's no... That's right. So, so uh, in okay. GL one is abelian. So, so a conjugacy class is just a single element, and you know, unique up to simultaneous anything. simultaneous conjug conjugation doesn't it's do not, anything. does doesn't do anything. So, any any n numbers count. Any n numbers count. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Um, there's a little lie in what I wrote here. So, so this geometric origin, uh, it really only holds if if the if the conjugacy classes have only root of unity eigenvalues. So. Okay. Thanks. Any any other questions? Okay, so so now I want to introduce this kind of dynamical question, which which motivates the talk. Okay, so suppose I have an n tuple of elements of a group G, which multiply to the identity. 
Uh, so I, I claim this is a kind of simple way to make a new a new n tuple. And so let me write it down. So I'm going to write down a bunch of operations on n tuples of elements of a group, which multiply to the identity. So so what's the idea? Is I want to switch the I want to swap the ith and the ith plus first element of the group. Okay, and you can't actually do that because matrix multiplication or you know multiplication of elements in a group is typically not commutative. Right, so so matrix multiplication is famously not commutative. So so what you, what do you have to do? You have to fix up, fix up your swapping. Um, and so what do you do? Well, you uh, leave all but the ith and ith plus first uh, group element alone, and then you conjugate the i plus first one by the ith and put it in the ith position, and then you put the gi in the ith plus first position, and then leave the rest alone. Okay, and if you stare at this formula for a little bit, you'll see that that what I've done, this sort of modified swapping, it preserves the property that the product of the group elements is the identity, right? So so you know you go up from G one to G i, then you get G i plus one, then you get G one i inverse, and then G i again. So here these two things cancel out, and you get just the product of the G's, which was the identity to start with. Okay, so this gives an action of some group, the group generated by the sigma i's, on n tuples of elements of G, and that, well, that of course descends to an action on n tuples of elements of G, modded out by simultaneous conjugation. Okay, so this is some dynamical system. It's a group action on a set. Um, I'm going to describe it in other ways shortly, but you can think of this as a really concrete thing. You start with, for example, if G is GLR, you start with n R by R matrices, which multiply to the identity, and then I'm going to produce new n tuples of R by R matrices by swapping them around and conjugating in this way. Okay, and, and the basic question here is just what are the dynamics of this action? Um, and, and this is something that's been studied for a very long time. I think the, the first uh, case I know where it was studied is, is by Markov in the 1860s, so who was studying the kind of dynamics of, of some affine cubic surface, which is a special case of this when, when G is SL2. Um, and then there's lots of recent work as well. So uh, Borgin, Gambert, and Sarnak have studied this dynamics. Uh, there's a beautiful recent paper by Will Chen on it. Uh, Goldman and other people, topologists have studied it. There's this ongoing work by uh, Eskin, Philippe, and Rodriguez Hertz. So this is, I mean, this is sort of a dynamical system that's like one of the best, best studied dynamical systems in all of mathematics. Okay, and I, I want to ask a kind of basic question about it when when G is an algebraic group. So think GLR or SLR, uh, which is is what are the what are the finite orbits of this action? Okay, so maybe that's the the, the most basic question you can ask about a dynamical system. Okay, um, so let me just kind of discuss a little bit about where, like where in, in arithmetic and, and topology this dynamical system shows up. So, so if G is finite, uh, understanding the orbits of this dynamics are the same as understanding the components or maybe the topology of Hurwitz spaces. So, so a, a tuple like this corresponded to a cover, a Hurwitz space is a moduli space of covers. And the dynamics of this action control like the components of that moduli space. Um, okay, and, and when G is an algebraic group, I'm going to spend the rest of the talk uh, discussing this. So, so maybe wait a second for, for some motivation. Uh, but maybe a remark is that this is just a strict generalization of the study of rigid tuples or rigid local systems. And why is that? Well, let's suppose you have a rigid local system, right? So what does that mean? It means that like up to conjugation, this tuple of, of matrices, for example, is just determined by the conjugacy classes. Well, what does this action do to those conjugacy classes? It just permutes them, right? So, so what that means is that if you have a rigid tuple, it has finite orbit under this action. So studying the finite orbits uh, contains studying rigid, rigid tuples or rigid local systems as a, as a, as a sub-question. Okay, uh, so I, I'm going to now talk about kind of the history of this question in the case where where G is like GLR or SLR, an algebraic group. So, so stop me now if you want to ask about the finite group case. Okay, so, so let me give you uh, some history. So for the rest of the talk, G will be an algebraic group and you'll lose very little by just thinking it's the general linear, linear group. Uh, maybe even SL2 is already gonna be very interesting. Um, so let me remind you what we're studying. So we take G to the N modulo simultaneous conjugation and we're studying the action of this group on it, which is given by these sort of modified swapping operations. I'll explain where this comes from shortly. It, it has a, a really kind of beautiful topological interpretation. Um, but but our, our question is just what are the finite orbits? Okay, so, so let me kind of tell you where this big group action comes from. 
Um, and I'll, I'll maybe even slightly generalize it a little bit. Um, so, okay, so uh, before we had sigma zero n, which was a two sphere minus n points. And well, zero, uh, you know, you should never write down a number in a talk. You should always make it a parameter, right? So, so zero now is going to be a G. And we're going to study sigma G n, which is a, a genus G surface with n punctures. Okay. Um, so here's kind of a pictorial definition. I, I've, I've drawn this was to be G handles here and n punctures. And uh, let me kind of uh, rewrite the set G to the n minus simulta mod simultaneous conjugation. Uh, it's, uh, I'm going to now call this XGN of capital G. And what is it? It's, it's, it's group homomorphisms from the fundamental group of my space. So remember, this was just free on n minus 1 generators uh, before, um, into G up to simultaneous conjugation. So, so this is this is the space we're interested in. If G is zero, this is what we were studying before. Okay, now where does the group action come from? Well, I, I think now it should be clear that there's a lot of symmetries of this situation. Anytime you have a symmetry of this surface sigma Gn, you get an automorphism of the set. Well, why? If you have an automorphism of the space, it acts on pi one, and so it'll act on representations of pi one. Okay, so let me now make that precise. So I'm gonna define a group mod gn, which generalizes this group sigma one through sigma n minus one from before. And what is it? Well, the, the maybe the topologist way of defining it is you take orientation preserving homeomorphisms of the space sigma gn, that's a topological group with the compact open topology, and you uh, take its component group. Okay, so uh, that thing has an outer action on the fundamental group of sigma gn, outer because these homeomorphisms don't have to preserve a base point, but nonetheless that induces an action of representations of pi one into g up to conjugation or isomorphism. Okay, uh, if you're an algebraic geometer, maybe another way of describing this group is pi one of mgn. Okay, I've written a little squiggly equals sign here because actually these things are only the same up to a finite index subgroup, but we're, 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 we're interested in finite orbits, so the difference won't matter. Okay, if G is zero, this is a very familiar thing. It's what we saw before, this group sigma one through sigma n minus one, which has another name. It's the spherical braid group on n strands. Um, and if n is zero, there's a really concrete group theoretic description. It's the outer automorphism. Again, uh, this is up to like an index two. The outer automorphism group of the fundamental group of pi one of sigma gn, which is some really explicit group with two g plus n generators in one relation. Okay, so so um, maybe this this last equality or squiggly equal sign should tell you that in fact you can make this problem like a question of pure algebra. Uh, it's really just a question about representations of some of pi one of a surface. Okay. And so, so just by the definition, so by the fact that this this group, which goes by the name the mapping class group, uh, has a has an action on the set, we have some dynamical system. So this group acts on sigma g n up to homotopy. So it acts on pi one. So it acts on the space of representations of pi one. And what we're interested in is, is studying the finite orbits of that action. Okay, so are there any questions about this sort of uh, the, the, the setup as a whole? Okay, so, so let me tell you, I think the first time people really uh, studied this. Okay, so, so uh, the first interesting case is where G is zero and N is four. So we have uh, P1 or the two sphere minus, minus four points. And then, well, the, maybe the smallest interesting group is SL, or algebraic group is SL2. Um, you could ask, well, why not N is three? And, and in that case, it's because this, this group, sigma one through sigma N minus one is, is actually a finite group. It's actually S3. So, so finite orbits are not interesting. Okay, so this is the first interesting case. Uh, and, and its study uh, goes back to maybe 1905 or something when, when the Penlevé six equation was discovered, not by Penlevé, but by, by Fuchs. Um, so here's the Penlevé six equation. I, I was too lazy to write it down, so I took a screenshot from Wikipedia. Um, and and the amazing property that this has is that, uh, and this is not supposed to be obvious, uh, 
is that uh, finite orbits of this action, so of mod 0, 4 on x0, 4 parentheses SL2 are the same as algebraic solutions to the Penlevé 6 equation. So if you're interested in studying algebraic solutions to the Penlevé 6 equation, and I'll tell you maybe why people were interested in that shortly, then you want to understand this dynamical system in the special case where you have a genus zero surface with four punctures and you're looking at uh, SL2 local systems. Okay, so, so what's the history of this question? So in, in 1912, Pam, so this is the first case I, I, I found the sort of question appearing in print. So, so Pam LeVay claimed that when you, when you write down a solution to this equation, maybe with some genericity assumption on the parameters, it's a new transcendental function. It's a transcendental function, which could not be written in terms of classical functions. And he gave some kind of argument, which I, I, I think by modern standards is not considered to be, well, not the statement was not even precise by modern standards, let alone the argument. Um, but this this was made, made precise, both the statement and the proof by Umamura, conditional on a classification of, of finite orbits or, or equivalently algebraic solutions. Okay, so so if you want to make this statement that Penlevé was trying to, to, to claim back in 1912 precise, you, you need some kind of classification like this. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so maybe let me just remark. So I think this this claim of Penlevé's, it was kind of to some, to, to at least a branch of differential Galois theory, what the claim that the quintic was insolvable by radicals was to, to honest Galois theory. So it was sort of some, some basic claim about transcendence of functions that motivated a huge amount of the development of, of differential Galois theory over the 20th century. Um, and it's at least at least sort of uh, related to, to this classification of, of finite orbits or algebraic solutions. Okay, so let me tell you what that classification looks like. Uh, and again, so this is just in the case where you have a genus zero surface with four punctures and are looking at SL2 representations. There was a huge amount of work starting like from when the Penlevé 6 equation was discovered uh, by Fuchs and Picard and other people, just writing down examples of algebraic solutions. Um, and I think this kind of continued with fits and starts over the, the course of, so the 20th century until I think Hitchin really revived the subject by um, well by, by rediscovering some of the same algebraic solutions that, that Fuchs did. Um, and then a lot of work on this was done by Bolch and Andrei Kidaev and Duran and other people. And then I think the first real attempt at a classification was done by Dubrovin and Matsako in the early 2000s. Um, and they, they gave a classification of, of finite orbits when, um, when, so right, so you have you have four two by two matrices, and and when when three of them are in the conjugacy class of one one zero one, and when the fourth is is um is is diagonalizable, um, and uh, okay, so the, uh, this is actually an amazing paper. So so not only do they classify finite orbits, they actually like write down the corresponding solutions to this algebraic differential equation, and if you like look in their their paper, they write down like a three page algebraic solution. It's like a it's a, a really a monumental work. Um, okay. Uh, and then, uh, so so finally in, in 2014, so about, about 110 years after this equation was first written down, the algebraic solutions were completely classified by Lusovian and Tippi, Tiki. Uh, so, so maybe let me say a little bit about the nature of the classification, because it's it's cool. Um, so first of all, it, it relied on some arithmetic input. So the, the sort of main ingredient is some kind of uh, effective uh, man and Mumford for Tori. Sorry, I, I won't say anything more about it than that. I, it was computer aided. So, so the nature of what they did is they they kind of figured out a way to reduce this to a finite computation. It's not obviously a finite computation. Um, and, and what they did is they showed that the list of algebraic solutions other people had found was actually the complete list. Um, okay, so, so what does the list look like? So it turns out that there's four continuous families of algebraic solutions. There's one infinite discrete family. And then there's there's 45 exceptional solutions. Okay, so so uh, the upshot here is it's kind of complicated. And, and in fact, I, I'm really actually suppressing a lot of the complicatedness. Uh, and the reason why is that Lisovi and Tiki kind of classify these algebraic solutions or equivalently finite orbits up to a kind of complicated equivalence relation. Um, so, so really each of these 
each of these families kind of represent several other families that are, are related to each other by some some moves one can make on, on finite orbits or, or algebraic solutions. Okay, so what's known, so the, this case uh, of genus zero and, and four punctures and SL2 is kind of in some sense understood, although there's still some open questions about it. So what's known beyond that? Um, so the answer is very little. Um, so let me kind of give a brief overview. So if in genus zero, when n is bigger than four, uh, so there's some sporadic examples in the SL2 case uh, due to Caligaris and Mitsako and others. Um, the case where where G is just upper triangular two by two matrices. So, so the case where you're looking at kind of representations which are not irreducible. Uh, this was classified by Cousin and Moussard. And then it's also, um, there's some work by McMullen that's uh, more or less equivalent. And then when N is five, there's a, a number of computations by Tiki, but it, it's kind of not exactly clear to me. I, I think it's plausible that he's found all the uh, solutions for SL2 or all the finite orbits for SL2, but, but uh, it's not clear to me like, to what extent there's a, a rigorous proof of that. Um, and then, then when G is bigger, when G is positive, uh, the genus is positive and, and you're looking at representations into SL2, there's a classification by, by Vizuas, Gupta, Munj, and Wang. Okay, so so let me tell you, um, so I think that's what was known maybe th three years ago. Uh, so let me tell you what was conjectured at the time, and then I'll, I'll tell you about some more recent work on the subject. Uh, so before I start kind of telling you about the conjectures, are there any questions? Oh, uh, yeah, Daniel, I have a question about the result of um, SL2. Yeah, yeah. So um, the continuous family is like, is it known like what the dimension is for those? Oh, yeah. Ev everything is known about them. Yeah, yeah. It's, I and think there's one of dimension three, you know, one of dimension two, maybe, th and three of dimension one, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. And I, and also, like, does it also classify like the sizes of the orbits too, or? Yeah, yeah, really, really. They, if you look at um, this paper of Lissopi and Tiki, it's great. They, they have like, Kaylee graphs of all the orbits. It's it's really, it's a beautiful piece of work. Oh yeah, thanks. And Daniel, I know you said my chance to ask about the finite group case was earlier, but like the, this classification, does it give you uniformly small orbits for SL2 FQ or does it not work like that? Like if you have- Yeah, yeah. It'll, it'll, it gives you all the, all. I mean, somehow it just, yeah, yeah. It, it'll give you all the, all the uniformly small orbits. Somehow there's like an ultra product trick you can do if you have a you know, uniformly small orbit, you can make a, a finite orbit and characteristics. Ah. Yeah. And you don't really need ultra products. You can also just use algebraic geometry. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Um, okay. So um, let me tell you what was conjectured um, and, and sort of part of what got me thinking about the subject. So um, I'm just going to uh, limit myself to the case where G is GLR. Uh, so I think there were kind of two conjectures about this story. Um, so the first one, one was conjectured. Uh, more or less independently, I think, by, by Kissin and then by, by Peter Wang. Um, and it's that if if G is large compared to the, the, the rank of our group here, so if G is large compared to the dimension of their representations, all finite orbits, well, uh, so a finite orbit, remember, you, you have a representation of this group into GLR and you want to ask if it has finite orbit. And there's an obvious way to get a finite orbit, which is if this representation has finite dimension. Okay, and the conjecture is that those are all. Uh, so, so there's basically no interesting finite orbits when, when G is big. That that was the compared to the, the dimension of the representation. So that that was the conjecture. Um, and then there was another conjecture about this, uh, which is is that actually there are a lot of finite orbits. So so the the, the finite orbits uh, are Zariski dense in in the space of of representations. Okay, so so here remember this was the space of representations of. This group into GLR up to up to isomorphism or up to controversy. Um, that has the structure of an algebraic variety. And if you have a set in it, like the set of all finite orbits, you can ask if it's risky dense. Uh, so you should think maybe the first conjecture is that there's not a lot of finite orbits, and the second is that there are a lot. Maybe let me remark, I'll, I'll say a little bit more about what this conjecture came, where this conjecture came from, but they, they really conjectured something much stronger. So they conjectured something like there were there were the, the set of representations of geometric origin where it's risky dense. But, but uh, that it implies what I wrote down. Okay, so the 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 first remark, and maybe it's not so surprising from what I've said, is that these conjectures can both be true; they, they contradict each other. 
So it, it's maybe not totally obvious from what I what I've written, but it should be plausible if the first conjecture says there's not a lot of finite orbits, and the second says that there's a lot. It's it, it's, it's um it, it, there's at least some tension between them. Okay, and it's 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 not totally trivial to see that the two contradictions can't both the two conjectures can't both be true, but it, it's not so bad. Um, okay, so so maybe let me say uh, where some of the motivation comes from. So so I think for uh, so I, I think for for Kissin, the the motivation for this question comes from some ideas around the P curvature conjecture, which is kind of how I got interested in it as well. Um, so this these conjectures are you know Kurtz and Buter Wang. Um, so, so they're interested in understanding representations of geometric origin, so, so, so local systems which show up in the cohomology of algebraic varieties. And there's a prediction that that representations of pi one of a variety with finite Galois orbit have have um, have that nature that they they come from they come from algebraic geometry. And so I, I view this this sort of dynamical system as maybe a function field analog of of that of that Galois orbit of that that Ga, like Galois theory question. Uh, and it really is, I mean, if you think about like local systems on the generic curve, it really is the same question. So it's it's studying kind of actions of the Galois group of the function field of MG on, on local systems on a curve. And maybe let me just make a remark, which is, I, I don't know that this expectation appears in the literature, but I, I think it's a plausible one, which is that, so so from this point of view of like uh, the relative fontaine maser conjecture, so like studying Galois actions on on, on local systems, uh, I think it's natural to expect that these finite orbits, maybe when the genus of your curve is at least three, are all uh, uh, all of geometric origin. So at least this is kind of compatible with some standard conjectures about mapping class groups and and rigid local systems. So uh, would, I, I can say more about that after the talk if you're interested. Okay. So so I think this was sort of the state of play uh, as of, as of two or three years ago. There were these two conjectures which. I mean, I think they were thought about by different communities of people, but they 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 couldn't both be true. Okay, so let me. Um, well, I'll tell you some theorems now. You can see the next section at the at the bottom of the page is called the theorems. But before I do that, you should ask me some questions if you have any. So when you say these um, contradict each other, is that for a fixed G N and R? And are there also implications where if one is false for certain parameters? Yes. So for fixed G N and R, as long as R is at least one. They, they sorry at least two they can't both be true mm -hmm. and, and for r is one they are both true actually mm -hmm. so yeah so as long as r is, is bigger than as long as r is bigger than um uh bigger than one they they, they can't be both true for the fit for the same gn yeah but, and what do you have to show you have to show that like representations with finite image are not Zariski dense that's not that you, it's a little argument with uh like jordan's theorem about finite subgroups of glr Any other any other questions? Okay, so so let me tell you. I, I kind of want to tell you two theorems. So one is about this general situation where you have curves of arbitrary genus and representations of arbitrary dimension, and so on and so forth. Um, and the other one is about a very special case. It's about genus zero and two by two matrices. Um, and so so I'm I'm going to just briefly talk about the general situation, and then for the rest of the talk, I'll talk about what we were talking about at the very beginning of the talk, so genus zero curves and two by two matrices. Okay, so, so the first theorem here is joined with the Aaron Lanzmann, um, and it says the following, which is uh, suppose G is at least R squared. Um, so we're interested in representations of a pi one of a genus G surface into GLR with finite uh, mapping class group orbit. Uh, and the theorem is that uh, in this regime, you finite mapping class group orbit if and only if your representation has finite image. Uh, so, so just a remark is you you really need some hypothesis along these lines, like the, the G has to be big. If you don't assume G is big compared to R, there's lots and lots of really interesting representations with infinite image and finite orbit. So after the talk, if you want, I can tell you how to make some. Um, okay, so so the corollary here is that the the this kind of resolves the two conjectures I mentioned before. So uh, this conjecture of Kissin and Wang that if G is big compared to R, there aren't interesting finite orbits, so they all have finite image, is true. And this conjecture of of uh, Eno Kurtz and Buter Wang is false. Uh, maybe let me just say it's false, but still really interesting. Like in the sense that I I, I think there's 
some some reason to believe that some variants of it should be true. And there's this really beautiful work of Aino and Pyong proving some kind of variant of it. And, and I think there's lots of other plausible uh, sort of interesting and, and interesting subsets of these spaces XGN of GLR, which should be risky dense and have some properties that are, are related to being of geometric origin or related to having finite orbit. Um, and so I'm not going to say anything about the proof of this theorem, except to say that it, it takes input from some hard mathematics. So so uh, so the, the proof uses some non-abelian Hodge theory and then also input from arithmetic. So, so also input from the Langlands program um, through the use of Eno Groenig's work on rigid local systems. So I mean, this is a, a it's sort of a fun example of a result really in pure like surface topology, which takes input from the Langlands program. Um, Okay, so that's that's the first uh, the first main result I wanted to talk about. Um, are there any questions about that before I I uh, for the rest of the talk I want to talk about two by two matrices. But before I specialize to two by two matrices. Okay, so so now I want to go to sort of the um, uh, original case where people were studying this question. So the case of and, and what where we started in the beginning of the talk, so the case of n matrices, where under this kind of swapping action, the, the you get you get finite orbit, um, and, and just the case of two by two matrices. And so the theorem here is joint with Josh Lamb and Aaron Landsman, and it's a complete classification of tuples of matrices in uh, GL two to the n. Uh, here, uh, there's of course a condition, namely that the product is the identity. Uh, with finite orbit under under the this mod zero n, so this group I described earlier, generated by sigma one through sigma n minus one, so the, the mapping class group or the, the spherical break group, um, and it's a complete classification under a condition, which is that one of these matrices has infinite order. Um, okay, so so that's not a theorem that's promising you a theorem, and I'm going to tell spend the rest of the talk kind of explaining the statement of the theorem. Um, okay, so so let me uh, let me give a precise statement. Uh, okay, so um, first of all, I'm going to just specialize to the case of SL2. Uh, this doesn't cost you anything. You can just multiply these matrices by a constant, by constants to make them have determinant one, and that doesn't change the fact that they have finite orbit. Um, so, 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 uh, so I'm going to make a definition. I'm going to say what it means for a tuple of matrices in SL2, uh, whose product is the identity to be interesting. Okay. So, so the first thing is, well, we're interested in tuples with finite orbit under this group. So, so if you if you start swapping them around using this sort of funny modified swap operation, you always get back to where you started. Uh, I'm going to assume that the subgroup of SL2 they generated is uh, Zariski dense. Um, so that's that uh, assumption does cost you something, but it costs you something that is already covered by other people's work. So, so the case where where the subgroup they generated is not Zariski dense, these finite orbits have already been classified by other people. So, so in the case. Um, uh, well, th th there's three possibilities. Either they live in a finite subgroup of SL2, and then the classification goes back to Schwartz, who classified finite subgroups of SL2 in the in the 19th century, or they're upper triangular, uh, and then the classification is by Cousin and Moussard. And then there's only one other maximal proper Zariski uh, closed subgroup of SL2, which is the infinite dihedral group, and that case is classified by Tiki. Um, so so we, we don't lose anything by making this... Oh. By making this assumption that they they generated a Zariski dense subgroup of SL two, and then I, I'm also going to assume that this uh, finite orbit doesn't move in a continuous family. Of finite orbits, okay, and it's it's less obvious that it's easy to classify the continuous family, but but basically the, the, there's work of Corlett Simpson which classifies non rigid two dimensional local systems on varieties. And and Diara used this in, in 2013 to classify to classify the continuous families of finite orbits, in this case of, of, of SL2 or GL2. And then there's one more assumption I want to make, which is that none of these matrices are plus or minus the identity. Okay, and this doesn't cost you anything. Why? Well, if one of the AIs is the identity, you can just throw it away. It doesn't affect anything. If it's minus the identity, you can multiply it by minus one and multiply one of your other matrices by minus one, and then it becomes the identity. And then you can throw it away. So, so in other words, if one of these matrices is a scalar matrix, it's not interesting. You can reduce the the finite orbit to to one with fewer fewer matrices. 
Okay, so, so I'm going to make all these assumptions, and I'll say that a, a tuple of matrices uh, is interesting if it satisfies these assumptions. Okay, and our goal is to classify interesting tuples. Uh, and, and I claim if you've classified the interesting tuples, you've classified all the tuples. Okay, and here's um, the precise statement of the theorem, which is is joint with with Josh and Aaron. Um, okay, so so what does it say? So suppose we have an interesting tuple of matrices. Um, and and moreover, so the the real hypothesis here that that means we don't have a complete classification of all finite orbits is that we need one of these AIs to have infinite order. Okay, then then the classification has the following structure. It says there's some explicit complex numbers, lambda one through lambda n, such that if you multiply these matrices lambda a, a i by lambda i, then they have the following form. They're M C chi, I'll say what that means, of B1 through B n. So they're produced from some other tuple of matrices, B1 through Bn, where here these B1 through Bn are n minus 2 by n minus 2 matrices. Uh, and the subgroup of GLn minus 2 they generate is a finite complex reflection group. OK, so in order for this theorem to make sense, I have to explain two things to you. I have to say, what is a finite complex reflection group? And what is this MC chi? OK, so, so let me do that now. So first of all, MC chi, we actually already saw. So this is Katz's middle convolution operation from the beginning of the talk. So we saw it in the sense that I told you it exists. And at the very end of the talk, I'll try to say something about what it is. Uh, but but I, I, I want to say it's just some explicit operation you can do on matrices. I think if you look at Katz, it looks a little bit forbidding, but it's really something you can plug into a computer and you plug in some matrices and you get out some other matrices. Uh, so I'll come back to that. But I want to say first, what is a finite complex reflection group? And like, in what sense is this really a classification of these finite orbits in the case of, of uh, n two by two matrices? OK, so so uh, first of all, I have to tell you uh, what is a pseudo reflection. So a finite complex reflection group is a finite group generated by pseudo reflections. And what is a pseudo reflection? It's a it's a R by R matrix, which is invertible and has the property that rank of B minus the identity is one. So in other words, it fixes a hyperplane. Uh, it's a pseudo reflection rather than a reflection because it might not have order two. It might not, the, the, the non-unit non eigenvalue might not be minus one. Um, okay, now what's a finite complex reflection group? Uh, well, it's a subgroup of the general linear group uh, and, and it has to satisfy two properties. So first of all, it has to be finite. And second of all, it has to be generated by these pseudo reflections. Okay, so in fact, the theorem is much more precise than this. So, so really, what you get is that n minus one of these matrices are actually pseudo reflections. And since these these matrices multiply to the identity, that tells you that the group they generate is is generated by pseudo reflections. Okay, so so in what sense is this really a classification? So I've maybe I've related classifying these finite orbits to to classifying tuples of matrices satisfying some arcane collection of properties. So okay, you you might reasonably complain. Well, now I've, you've made the problem harder. You know, here are these matrices that we started with two by two matrices, and now we get n minus two by n minus two matrices. Like how how have we made any progress? Um, and the, the reason we made progress is that actually these finite complex reflection groups were classified by Shepard and Todd in the in 1956. Um, so so we actually know essentially everything about finite complex reflection groups. Uh, let me tell you what they look like. Uh, so there's there's one infinite family, uh, which usually goes by the name uh, GMPN, and it lives inside of GLNC. Um, and here I've written down a formula for, I guess, GM1N, but it, it, these groups are very simple that you'd basically just take permutation matrices, and instead of ones, you put mth roots of unity in. So that, that's what GM1N is. It's, it's permutation matrices where instead of ones, you have mth roots of unity, and then GMPN is some index P subgroup of that. Uh, so that's the infinite family, and then there's there's 34 exceptional finite complex reflection groups, uh, and some of them are probably familiar. So I, uh, the automorphism group of the icosahedron is one. The vial group of the of the root system E8 is another one. Uh, the automorphism group of the 600 cell, which is some four dimensional polytope, is another one, and so on and so forth. Some of them are probably less familiar. So there's there's a group pretty them called W of K6, which lives in GL6 and has something like 100 million elements. Um, which uh, I find a little bit more intimidating. Um, okay, so so the, there's a classification is, is the upshot here. Um, 
So, so maybe just to give you the sense that this kind of classification of finite orbits is actually useful, you can use it to get really kind of concrete info. So here's, I think, the, the, the most basic statement I know. So, so suppose we have a, a collection of, of these two by two matrices with finite orbit satisfying the other list of hypotheses I, I mentioned above. And also one of them has infinite order. So, so the sort of non-trivial, non the, the, the sort of interesting hypothesis. So the, then the, the statement is that it's actually at most six of the matrices. Okay, so there's not, it says that, that there actually wasn't that much left to find. Um, and this is this is sharp. So there are examples uh, with six matrices. Um, maybe let me just say a word about how one deduces this corollary from the classification. So, so I don't know a direct proof of this corollary. Like the way we prove this corollary is we first show that these finite orbits that we were studying are related by middle convolution to finite complex reflection groups. And then we use the classification of finite complex reflection groups to say that there, there are there's sort of no examples when 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 you have more than six matrices. Um, so it's a really indirect argument. Okay, so um, I in the next five minutes I want to give you an idea of what what middle convolution is. So so what is this operation MC chi that appears in in the statement? Uh, so so before I do that, are there any questions? Uh, so what's middle convolution? Okay, so so we're trying to understand some local systems on S2 minus some points, which I'm going to view as P1 minus D. And I'm going to make the harmless assumption just for notation that infinity is a point of D. So uh, infinity is one of our punctures. You can always do that just by, by relabeling, reparameterizing P1. Okay, so here's some complicated diagram, which is supposed to explain what middle convolution is. So I'm going to give you a sort of formal definition, and then I'll say what it really means. Uh, okay, so so what are the objects in this diagram? So you take x cross x minus the diagonal. So that's some open inside of P1 cross P1. It maps to x. It includes into P1 cross x. And then you can also take the other projection to x. And then there's one more player in this diagram, which is that, well, given an element of x cross, a point of x cross x, so you can think of that as given by two numbers. Uh, those numbers aren't equal because I've deleted the diagonal and neither of them are infinity, because I've deleted infinity, then I can send them to a1 minus the origin just by sending x comma y to x minus y. And that's well-defined because I deleted the diagonal and I deleted the, the divisors p1 cross infinity and infinity cross p1. Okay, so uh, what is middle convolution? So there was a parameter chi, which is going to be a rank one local system on a1 minus the origin. That's just a representation of pi one of a1 minus the origin, which is z, so it's just a number. Um, and a local system on X. Okay, so what is MC chi of this local system on X? It's a new local system on X, which has the following form. It's R1 pi two lower star of J lower star of pi one upper star V tensored with alpha upper star chi. Sorry. Okay, so that's kind of complicated. Um, let me say what it actually means in, in the case we care about. Um, so, so the case we care about is the special case where V has finite monodromy group G, and you're supposed to think it's a finite complex reflection. So, so here we're, we're applying it to the local system with monodromy matrices B1 through Pn, and I told you it's a finite complex reflection group, and I want to tell you what is the output of that procedure. And it's the following thing. So, so V has some finite monodromy group G, think the finite complex reflection group, and chi is some local system which who, uh, on, on A1 minus the origin with the property that it's eighth power is trivial. So in other words, the, the if you take the loop around A1 minus the, around zero and A1 minus the origin, the monodromy is given by a, an eighth root of unity. So then, then middle convolution has the following property. There exists some family of curves, Y over X, whose fiber over a point little X and X. So here, let me pick a point little X and X and tell you what the fiber Y sub X is. It's a cover of P1 with Galois group G times Z mod AZ, where here G is our finite complex reflection group and A is the order of our rank one local system. And it's branched over D, our deleted points, and also this moving point X. So what is middle convolution? 
it's 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 a, a specific specific piece of the cohomology of this family of curves. Okay, so uh, what we've done is produced out of a finite group in a number a some family of curves, or that's what middle convolution does, and then you pick out an appropriate piece of the cohomology of the family of curves, and that's the the middle convolution of v. Okay, so so let me just finish by telling you what I view as the upshot of this. So so here we have some kind of classification of finite orbits when uh, we have n two by two matrices. And the upshot is that all those finite orbits have kind of a good geometric explanation. So they have a good geometric explanation. So not only as in cats are they of geometric origin, but they're they're of geometric origin in a, a way that I find to be like particularly clean and beautiful. So they come from covers of P1, whose Galois group is, is a finite complex reflection group. And I think that's all I wanted to say. Thanks, Daniel. Does anyone have any questions? Why is this middle convolution? Why is it middle convolution? Okay. I mean, I think it's so, right. So when Katz describes this operation, I mean, I kind of give, even this definition is like not exactly what Katz wrote, it's equivalent, but Katz describes it in terms of some perverse sheaves. So there's a, this J lower star is a, a middle extension. I think that's, that's, that's where it comes from, I, I think. Did you also say it changes rank somehow? Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's a really see, fun thing. So, oh, oh, sorry. Can on, you we'll... slow down and explain how, how the rank changed? Yeah, so it's, it's kind of fun, right? So in Katz's, in Katz's construction, when he's studying rigid local systems, it decreases the rank, right? So you start with rank whatever, and then you keep going until you hit one. So, so in our situation, it's actually quite different. And, and I think this is maybe one of the most fun things about the classification. So I appreciate the question. So here we started with some, some rank two local system. And then the output was a rank n minus two local system. So it uh -huh. increased the rank, but it made it simpler in another way. So you start uh -huh. with something infinite or even Zariski dense monodromy, and you end up with something with finite monodromy. Uh -huh. uh, and and so, you know, it's very special kind of finite monodromy where you can totally understand it. Uh -huh. um, so yeah, so so it, it, so so it, it's kind of fun. So in, when you have four two by two matrices, so the Pendle Bay six case, then n minus two is two, and so you go from two by two matrices to two by two matrices. And in that case, it was sort of a very famous symmetry of the Pendle Bay six equation called the Okamoto transform. But when you add more points, it actually makes the local systems bigger, which is, I think maybe why people miss this. Um, and but it, it still makes them simpler, kind of interesting and an understandable way. Mm -hmm. Wait, sorry. So no, I just want to say that explicit description you said R pi two lower star pi one uh, pull back yeah. tensor. I just want to see where how it changes rank. I'm, can you just add some numbers for me? Uh, it's uh, kind of complicated. I, I would have. Oh, to, it's complicated. We, yeah, I mean, I, you, we can do it. It's the it's just like the the you know computation of the Euler okay, characters but can, on, uh, the system on a curve. But yeah, the I see. The, well, where does it go from rank what to rank what? If you just tell me the numbers, I'll try to figure out. So. V say has rank n and so then v it has becomes rank two and this total thing has rank n minus two, where n is the n is the number of points of D. D. Okay. Uh-huh. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So I mean it's, great, it's not great. actually hard to figure out. So the the only slightly complicated thing is this J lower star, which means the number of like the multiplicity of the eigenvalue one in the local monitor me shows up. Mm -hmm. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Maybe I'll just mention that um, there was also a spinoff of middle convolution some years ago in the case of finite groups where people started with rigid triples because those are not too hard to find. And then they were able to use that variant construction to get rigid tuples that, would, that are more than triples. And so that let people get realized groups as Galois groups using rigidity in ways they couldn't before because it was too hard to find examples where it wasn't just a triple. And so this was big around 20 years ago. Seems Ooh. to have petered out though. Do you know what what is this what what is the reference here? Yeah, well, I can, let me throw out the name Michael Detweiler. Oh, okay. uh, so he he and others were doing things like that uh, around then, and I actually haven't been hearing about it since then. So I don't know if there's been any more recent work since the flurry of activity around then. Yeah, so so I I learned a lot about this middle convolution stuff from these papers of Detweiler and Ryder. So so yeah, that that if you want a place to look, I mean, Katz's book is amazing, but but. Uh, you know, Dead Violet and Ryder have some kind right, of- Right, right, those two, yeah, especially. And they were working with some other people too, Volkline and, and others, mm -hmm. but yes. Mm -hmm. 
Well, great. Let's thank Daniel again. And our next talk is December 12th with Andrew Obis.